webinar on um, establishing an effective neurodiversity employment program. Uh, my name is Mike Burnick. I'm counsel with the law firm of Dwayne Morris, and I will be one of the presenters, along with uh, David Curon of Autism Speaks, Suzanne Breer of Cornell University, Deborah D of SAP, and Linda Hollingshead, also with Dwayne Morris, and a prominent expert nationwide on the ADA. Now, as I've said, we have a lot to cover today and are committed to finishing within an hour, so we'll be moving very quickly. We do see, though, this as the start of an ongoing collaboration, both individually and collectively as a group. Uh, let me emphasize, um, we plan time at the end of our presentation to take questions, so please feel free to type in questions at any point, and we will try to get to all of them. Uh, you will find a Q&A box on your screen where you can submit questions. If we run out of time today, we'll reach out to those of you who submit questions that we don't get to and provide responses. Um, I've already got received a number of questions in advance, um, but again, if uh, as people have questions, let me um, encourage you to type them in. Um, Linda tells me the most interesting part of these webinars is the discussion. Um, Pat, is there anything more about typing in questions that we want to note? No, uh, just that we'll follow up afterwards if we don't get to them all. Great. This webinar is being recorded, so let's get started. Um, I've asked um, first Jim Brown, who's a senior partner of our national employment group, to um, introduce the webinar. Jim? Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, hello, everyone. As uh, Michael said, I am a senior partner in Dwayne Morris's employment group. I have spent the last 30 years advising clients on a whole panoply of uh, workplace issues. I do want to say that Dwayne Morris is uh, excited about this opportunity to present this webinar. We are an international law firm, and we are committed internally to diversity and inclusion, and we're also committed to helping our clients in their own efforts at diversity and inclusion, both in the uh, neurodiversity uh, arena and in all others. Um, um, with that said, I look forward to providing uh, useful uh, information today as the as the webinar continues. Michael? Thank you, Jim. Let's go right to the uh, first slide. Um, let me quickly note the um, outcomes. Um, we're going to be covering three broad areas. One is the growing neurodiversity employment movement and how it is impacting firms. Two, legal issues being raised regarding hiring, targeted services, and progressive discipline, and how they can be addressed. And three, I think particularly interesting, how a well-structured program can reduce the likelihood of ADA and related claims. A word first on this grow, growing neurodiversity employment movement. Um, it's very interesting. I've been in the autism or neurodiversity field since the early 1990s. At that time, if anyone knew about autism or you mentioned autism, people might know Rain Man, but that was it. Today, um, you can't mention it, or whenever I mention it, um, people say, hey, I have a niece, nephew, grandchild, neighbor. Um, the nexus with people is so much wider. And uh, part of that is I think David and Suzanne will be talking about is simply demographics. Um, the numbers, um, both in autism and broader neurodiversity, um, have increased dramatically and are projected to increase. I think a second factor is the shifting employment expectations. Um, a few years ago, I did a book, The Autism Job Club, that looked at some of the early, very early um, employment initiatives in this field. And I began to hear from parents, family members across, and people on the spectrum um, across the United States. And it's very interesting, you know, the, in the past um, 20 years ago, employment discussions would have been either sheltered workshops or relatively modest. Now I think what we're seeing is very different employment expectations in terms of mainstream employment. Um, and then I think in some ways the main factor um, is the drive by family members and others advocating within a company. As we look at the major 
employment initiatives, or many of them, um, we see that they're driven by family members within a company who are pushing to um, develop these programs, whether it's SAP or Microsoft, uh, obviously the most prominent of them, or any of the others. So um, what we're seeing is this combination of forces that have pushed forward this um, neurodiversity employment movement, and I think will continue to do so. With that, let me, I've asked um, two of the people who are most involved in terms of working with employers to um, speak. I, I missed the slide, let me also say, um, as well as this movement nationally in terms of um, working with companies, we see also within the law um, a growing recognition of neurodiversity, discussion of neurodiversity hiring, law review articles. I don't have time today to go into these in detail. I just cited two recent articles um, and links to them um, concerning expanding notions of diversity and a focus on neurodiversity. And I um, recommend as, as people are interested to take a, take a look at these. But again, it's consistent with this emergence of neurodiversity employment, um, both generally in society and in law. With that, let me um, turn it to two of the people who I think are most involved working with employers, um, who I know in the United States, um, David and Suzanne, they're very practical. They work with specific companies and uh, try to help them put together programs. And uh, let me turn it over, uh, David, first to you to talk about um, what you're seeing working with employers. Great, thank you, Mike. And I'd like to thank Mike and, and Jim and Dwayne Morris for hosting this very important webinar. I'm going to take only about four minutes of your time and um, and I'll get out of the way and let, let some really great experts speak on these topics. What I wanted to do first, though, is just um, a clarification. Um, you hear, you'll hear these terms, neurodiversity and autism spectrum disorder. So just to clarify, you know, neurodiversity is a concept and it has become a real social movement that advocates for viewing autism, dyspraxia, dyslexia, ADHD, um, Tourette syndrome, and, and, and other conditions as variations of human wiring, right? Different approaches to different ways of thinking. And what employers are seeing is innovative ways of problem solving. Um, many autistic people and others in the neurodiversity movement do not see their autism as a disability, but as a simply a different way of being. Um, that being said, you know, the, the full term for autism is an autism spectrum disorder. Um, it is a you know, neurodevelopmental disorder and I really like this image on the right here. I think for too long we pictured the autism spectrum as a two-dimensional line, where at one end you had someone um, who may have some uh, mild social impairments, uh, be a bit awkward, uh, not uh, date or, or get married, but is exceptionally bright and works at NASA as a mathematician. And at the other end of the line was someone with profound um, intellectual disability, uh, profound dead living skills deficits and will never live on his or her own and needs help with e every activity of daily living. And those two extremes do exist, but it's not a simple two-dimensional line. It's a much more complex picture. And this, again, is just within autism. You have to think about this picture within those other categories as well. But autism is characterized by challenges with social skills, repetitive behaviors, and, and verbal and nonverbal communication. But as you can imagine, those deficits really are barriers to employment when we still rely on traditional face-to-face -face interviews, uh, for most cases, as the gateway to employment. Um, and Dave, we're learning. Yes, Mike. Yes, Dave, let me ask. Um, I think you do emphasize the spectrum. I know that you, in working with employers, are not just focused on placing people at the so-called higher function ends, but really employment mm -hmm. for all people. Um, throughout the range of um, skills. That's right. It, you know, we're really excited and proud to support the initiatives at these companies. You're going to hear from uh, SAP today. It's a wonderful initiative, and others like Microsoft and, and, and J.P. Morgan Chase. What, what I have become concerned with a bit is uh, pigeonholing of people with autism 
into technology and IT related fields only. And it's simply not the case that all people with autism have such a narrow uh, focus of interest and strengths and skills. It is as varied as it is amongst the, the general population. So it's really important to us that we are speaking with companies from all industries and especially important that we talk with businesses that have opportunities that could be meaningful and a good match for people who are more disabled by their autism and not just the most exceptionally talented. Well, so the reason, the, the reason why this is so crucial, and Mike touched on this earlier, is the rising um, estimate of autism prevalence in the United States and around the globe. Uh, as you can see on this chart here, we're now at one in 59 children in America are diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. And one important thing to note here is this is the CDC uses cohorts of eight-year-olds for these estimates. So these kids are now 18, 28, and they are entering the workforce. Our estimates are that 50,000 young adults with autism are entering adulthood every year, half a million over the next decade, and that will only increase. Next slide, please, Mike. So here's why this is so important to you uh, and to your companies, and, and hopefully it will be part of your hiring initiatives uh, soon if it's not already, is that the global estimates of unemployment and underemployment for people with autism is exceptionally high. Uh, 80 to 90 percent is what a lot of the research is pointing to, towards, and that underemployment number is actually really important here. There are so many people with autism who are intellectually and academically successful, but because of their social deficits and the, their communication challenges that are inherent in their disability, they are not getting the opportunities that are suited to their capabilities. And despite the amazing initiatives that companies like SAP and others, this has not changed. And we're really not making an impact until we can break into other industries and, and other job opportunities and really make sure our entire community is served. And lastly, I just really wanted to finish on this. Um, I just talked about the disability side of autism and neurodiversity. There are many, many strengths. And what we, when we talk about employment, this is really what we're talking about. Uh, people with autism have um, a lot of common strengths. Uh, every individual is different, of course, and unique. Um, so there's a lot of variability, but here are some very common strengths that have made them attractive to employers as an untaped, untapped labor pool. And my last um, just statement here, Mike, is, you know, um, I appreciate everyone being on. I, I, I am concerned at times that some businesses are slow to start an initiative because of some legal concerns, the, some fear of the unknown, fear of risk. And I would just want to say that I think, I think these concerns are valid often, but it's important to know that it, they can be effectively addressed and overcome. Um, so there is, there is some risk there, but it's very manageable risk. And I'm so glad that we have experts on today's webinar to tell you what they've done, how they have overcome them. And um, Autism Speaks is, is proud to be part of this effort. So thanks for having us. Thank you, Dave. Excellent. And we'll we're going to get to those legal issues um, very soon. But first, I'd like also, Suzanne, you work closely with uh, employers. Um, if you can say something in terms of your experiences and issues you see. I'm happy to, Mike. Thank you very much. And thanks for the opportunity to be on this webinar and share our perspectives so that we, as David was saying, mitigate some of the concerns and provide encouragement and support for those companies who are exploring this. Um, our interest, I was, uh, I was asked to share, um, uh, are really related to building off of our long-term work in the disability inclusion area where we have done a lot of research and developed a lot of good practice protocols. Um, one example of how people can access those if of interest is a benchmarkability online tool of 90 items for employers that show how to increase inclusion across the employment process. And, and we're building off of that when we work with employers now, thinking about what's good practice. We also um, have are trying to work with our undergraduates who are the HR professionals of the future in teaching them about what this practice is all about so they can be supporting their workplaces when they get out there. And we have internships for our undergraduates as well as a course here on campus. We are in the process of designing online training, and um, we are working with different higher education institutions to think of what's a more effective way to get 
graduates from the educational sector into work, how can we smooth that process, which many employers are telling us are one of their biggest problems, is finding the candidates that they would like to hire um, and being able to access that labor pool. And we are continuing to look at how we can figure out which practices are the most effective. So we're looking at program efficacy elements. And naturally what I came to share with people today are what are those, those elements. <coughs> Um, and, and they are things like making a program a part of the company's strategic imperative. We have found that when companies have um, a set goal and articulate that from the top management and say that this has to do with um, being a business imperative and, and is embedded in the values of the company, it is a much more effective approach than just for legal compliance. So, Having, thinking about this as a part of your human capital development plan and conveying that to everyone in your workforce is an important part of success. We also encourage employers to think about where this is housed. Um, there are all kinds of approaches being used now. None of them is really wrong. I think it's just important to think about what messaging you're conveying to your company about where you position this program. Is it a part of hu human capital development? Is it a part of business development, um, what, what, where is this best positioned? One of the things we've seen is the most effective in moving companies along uh, progressively is having a, a relationships with community organizations and universities that can be feeders of talent, as I just mentioned. So thinking about who are your community partners who serve people um, who are neurodiverse across all the categories that David mentioned to you, particularly people with autism we're, we're focused on today, it's going to mean that you have a leg up in getting started. That's a really important part of getting established. We also, in talking with companies, realize how important it is that this initiative be conveyed both inside the organization so that people understand it is a part of the strategic uh, imperative, but also external to the organization, that the community knows that the company is committed to this affirmative hiring and eager to have candidates forwarded to them. This will help with your recruitment process as well as get your internal um, company on board, your, your employees and your supervisors. One of the most effective things in getting these new participants established is an, is an orientation program and we see companies doing all kinds of innovative things to get people in the door and then to get them company acculturated and so thinking about how you will let, let the new participants know what the company is all about, what is, um, is appropriate social interaction, how to access resources in the company is a really important part of getting them settled in uh, in the very beginning of the program. We see many companies doing staff training, both for coworkers and for supervisors, especially in the teams that have taken on a new recruit who is a person with autism, and that's a really important part of long-term retention of people, is building these workplace cultures that are supportive. Preparing for accommodation and supports as needed. David uh, spoke a bit about the kinds of, of uh, considerations that people might have given the characteristics of people who are autistic, and so being proactively aware of that and having your systems in place to be able to respond in a timely way is really important. And linking that to company resources. I'm not, uh, we're not really suggesting establishing new mechanisms, but rather having your existing mechanisms um, equipped, like your employee assistance program or your uh, uh, accommodation program, ready to respond in a timely way. And, and it's, I would say, really important early on to think about not just uh, a, a, not just hiring people, but also moving them through the system, giving them an opportunity for development. So in closing, I'd like to say the, these initiatives afford a tremendous opportunity to provide employment to a previously marginalized, marginalized population, and many uh, employers are proactively doing this. The ADA has provided protections for 30 years, and we all probably are pretty familiar with that, but there are some unique considerations, which our colleagues are going to apprise you about it, it and what, one of the things that's exciting about this is, is this is a place where difference is being perceived as an asset and we can learn a lot about this, about what true company inclusion is from this perspective. And uh, there are lots of interests and stakeholders that need to be considered 
in minimizing risk and making these initiatives a success. And our colleagues will be providing more information to you about that as we move along. Thank you. Excellent. Well, let's now turn to um, the legal question. Yeah, so hi, hi everybody. This is Deborah D. I work at uh, SAP and I support human resources exclusively. So my career has been focused on employment law and I was really fortunate to meet Jose Velasco at SAP who brought me into our Autism at Work program, um, which we are very proud of. And I'm gonna talk for just a couple minutes, a very high level overview of SAP and our Autism at Work program, and then turn it over to Linda who will talk about very specific employment uh, law considerations and we'll kind of tag team together to go through some of the things we've thought about and considered and worked through. So as, as I'm sure a lot of you know, SAP is a software development company and obviously we are sitting in the tech industry now, but we have a huge commitment to help the world run better and improve people's lives. Um, you can see on the slide that's in front of you, we have over 400,000 customers in over 180 com uh, countries. We have over 93,000 employees, over 17,000 partners, and we serve 25 different industries. Um, I think one of the really important things to mention is that we were named number 28 on Fortune's Top 100 Places to Work in 2017, and I do think a huge part of that is our commitment to diversity and inclusion. Yeah. So, you know, before I even go into our program, our commitment to diversity and inclusion is not necessarily a goodwill effort. We benefit immensely from that. Because we are not limited by our own biases, we are able to recruit individuals from all different backgrounds and skill sets and geographies and beliefs um, and medical conditions or diagnoses, and when we're not limited by that, we are able to hire the best of the best all across the board. So our Autism at Work program was created in 2013, and as of today, we have over 140 colleagues in the program, over 12 different countries. Um, the retention rate for employees in the program is somewhere between 92 and 94 percent, which I think is pretty outstanding. Um, and I think David had mentioned earlier that it's important not to pigeonhole people into tech-type roles. And of course, while SAP is a tech company, what we've seen is that we don't have individuals in the program that are in very tech-specific roles. Of course, we have individuals in developer roles and software tester roles, but we have individuals in our HR organization as graphic designers, customer support associates, um, in finance. So we are seeing people with skill sets across the board. Next slide. Awesome. So I think we have two main goals of our program was to create a different path to success for individuals by providing opportunities for people who do things in a different way than maybe a neurotypical individual would. And a second goal, which I think is very important too, is, is the concept of self-determination. We want to provide these opportunities so that individuals can manage their own careers. And we don't want to be telling people where they need to go or how they need to, need to do things. We're providing them with the tools so that they can make their own decisions. Um, we offer several different benefits kind of grouped into different sections. Um, the first thing we offer is pre-hire training. So we work closely with partners across really across the globe. This is very U.S. focused today. So our main partner in the U.S. is the ARC, um, and we partner with them to create a pre-hire training program. The ARC screens individuals to determine if they're able to participate in this type of training. It's a, obviously a classroom corporate program, so they are looking at individuals to determine if, if they're able to um, participate in that type of program. The training itself is funded by the government, but it's delivered jointly between SAP and the ARC. Um, there's no guarantee of a role at the end of the training, so while we hope that everybody is able to get a role at SAP, that's certainly not um, a requirement or a guarantee. Individuals can certainly take the skills that they've learned and, and apply for jobs elsewhere as well. Um, after that training program, we also provide uh, recruitment support. So if an individual identifies a role that they want to apply for, they'll work with the ARC to review the openings, um, evaluate whether their skill set is a good fit for that role, 
um, and then they can apply for the role. If they receive an interview, our program immediately steps in. We reach out to the individual involved, um, the candidate, the hiring manager, the recruiter, and we provide some a little bit of training and, and guidance um, in terms of conducting an accommodated interview. A lot of this is at a very high level because, as I think everybody's aware, individuals are, are individuals, and so there's not one specific guidebook that's going to apply for everyone. So this guidance is pretty high level, but it explains things like, you know, you might not expect somebody to provide direct eye contact, or some individuals might be adverse to handshakes. So it's providing awareness to our interviewers so that they understand what they are getting into as well. After individuals are onboarded, um, they are given the option to have our program provide training for their new manager and their team. This is part of the self-determination concept. Some individuals, and I think honestly most of them, are open to providing this training to their managers and their team, but some might not be, and, and that's okay as well. We also assign each individual a coach, it's through the ARC or through another partner, a mentor who's an internal SAP individual that's not within their own team to help them get acclimated to SAP as a company, um, and they're also assigned a buddy within their own team to help them navigate through their specific team and their specific role. Um, I do want to mention that these mentors and buddies is not something that's exclusive to the program. This is something that's open to anybody at SAP. Anybody who wants a buddy or a mentor has the ability to ask for one and, and get one, but this is just something that we're offering very specifically to individuals in the program so they know it's available. And of course, any kind of necessary and reasonable accommodations are always provided. Um, yeah, and I think that's it for us at a high level. Thanks, Deb. And this is Linda Holland said, and I want to thank the folks, including um, Deb and others at SAP, for giving us some of that uh, background on the program. It's, it's the kind of program that we know has had great success and is, is really viewed by other employers as uh, exemplifying a creativity and a lot of the, the goodwill of a lot of organizations coming together to work with an employer. And so um, I'm here. I happen to be in Joy Morris' Philadelphia office. I'm at, and pleased to be with all of you today. And I'm, I'm sort of tasked with putting a little additional context on some of our discussion, talk a little bit about what the law provides, and then, as Deb mentioned, I'll sort of tee this up to uh, my colleagues who are on the line with us uh, to certainly uh, feel free to chime in and, and provide uh, additional uh, clarification or explanation on certain points, because one of the things that we're discovering, you know, we feel like we're a little bit ahead of where some of the discussion is in this area because, um, and I think rightly so, a lot of uh, very specific groups have come together and said this is something we want to aspire uh, to, this is how we want our organization to handle these issues, and in some of these instances, I know employers who are not quite at that same point may have some reluctance, as David mentioned, or concern that in doing so, they're potentially creating additional risk or risk that perhaps can't be managed. And, you know, in, in the long enough time that I've been doing this in the ADA area or in other areas, I think it's, you know, it's fair to say any decision an employer makes has, carries with it some amount of risk. And in this situation, what we have found is that employers who put together programs, whether they're formal or even more informally adopting some of the principles and the concepts of what we're going to be talking about today, are finding that it is a real win-win. Uh, and you'll hear that expression used time and time again. But it's really not only from the operational standpoint, um, and from the employee relations standpoint that it's successful, but it really, I think, synthesizes very nicely with an employer's you know, existing and continuing obligation to provide accommodations. And it is a really good, strong vehicle, um, both to practically create opportunities to meet those obligations, but also to increase awareness overall. And I think the more an organization is sensitized to these issues and views it as a positive as opposed to a deterrent for being successful, the more likely employers are going to be able to say, you know, I want to be 
at this point, you know, similar to an SAP or other organizations that have had great success. Um, obviously, when you talk about these issues, there's a couple laws that are in play. We um, have to think a little bit about the Americans with Disabilities Act, which, as we all know, talks both in terms of non-discrimination against those who are disabled, who previously had disabilities, who are regarded as being disabled, and there's an associational disability claim there as well. But also, and probably most critical to our discussion today, is the reasonable accommodation obligation. Um, every state uh, has a similar non-discrimination reasonable accommodation obligation as well. We're going to focus on the federal law, but remember that this is a multi-layered approach um, in this area of the law, as with any type of protected category um, under employment laws. The um, ADA was amended a few years ago, back in 2009, by the ADA Amendments Act. And when that happened, not only, I think, generally did the law and the court decisions sort of track the expansion of the definition of disability and, along with that, increasing awareness and, I think, employer understanding and appreciation of the obligation to accommodate, but I do think it also has tracked nicely with the uh, understanding and appreciation of employers that in the area of neurodiversity, it's really important to recognize how broad, as something um, David and, and Dee were, were discussing, how broad it is that we have to consider these issues. It's not somebody who's just at a highly functioning level, it's across the board, and there are numerous opportunities for employers to successfully address this accommodation obligation. Um, and the ADA Amendments Act, when it expanded and really more specifically defined what are some of the physical and mental impairments that individuals um, may have that would entitle them to be protected, you know, we've got now specific uh, enumeration of things that fall, as some of these are highlighted on this slide, that fall within the area that we're talking about today. And I think that as, you know, we've seen case law develop since the inception of the ADA Amendments Act, we've seen that there is an appreciation by the courts and understanding increasingly by employers of the fact that in these types of conditions, uh, while maybe need to be differently accommodated are no less um, ones that we need to be concerned about as employers and meet our obligation as some other um, type of condition that employers may have had more experience in the past in how to accommodate. I think it's rem remarkable or important to remember that the ADA defines disability very, very broadly. Um, there are a lot of major life activities um, that we have to be thinking about because the ADA says you must reasonably accommodate an individual who's disabled, who is unable to perform the essential functions of one or more reasonable uh, major life activities, concentrating, thinking, communicating, interacting with others. These are all key components of, um, of uh, challenges and issues that some individuals may face when they are interacting in a workplace. And the ADA recognizes those as major life activities, which I think has really um, created and, and gotten us past what sometimes was a legal hurdle for individuals in this area in terms of getting the protections under the law. The reasonable accommodation process, and something I want to sort of emphasize that Dee said, is that it is individualized. There is um, great success that we can come, that can come from programs like SAPs and others where they've identified real um, solutions to issues and challenges, but each person has a, a different spot to where they need to land with these issues. And when you go through the interactive process, you have to look at it from what does this particular individual need in this particular position. And we can learn from what we've done in the past. We can build on that. We can get great successes that way. But we have to realize that that is not our only obligation. And sometimes employers are concerned on the legal issues. You know, well, if I do this over here, how is this going to impact the rest of my organization? And I kind of come back to the basic principle of whether or not you have a formal uh, autism at work or other sort of specific program, specifically enumerated program, your obligations remain the same as an employer. You have to do um, what is reasonable um, and, and, and what is appropriate for that particular individual. Of course, there are some exceptions that would apply in this context as well as anywhere else. You know, you don't have to provide an accommodation where it's an undue hardship. It's a very high standard. It is typically not uh, in any way, or I don't want to say in any way, it is not typically influenced by the monetary costs. Uh, the larger the employer, the more courts will expect uh, employers to have the resources and use those resources. Um, one of the great things about the kinds of conditions we're talking about today is that there are a lot of other uh, public interest groups and uh, not-for-profits and other uh, affiliated organizations that have the resources and are available to partner with employers, thus eliminating a lot of the cost issues that some smaller employers might be concerned about. 
Um, there also are, you know, defenses against having to accommodate if there's a direct threat, uh, but I would certainly mention to you that, again, a lot of the courts are looking at this and saying, yes, you can still discipline for conduct-related reasons. Nothing we're going to talk about today prevents that conceptually, but I think one of the, the concerns that employers have about, you know, issues of behavior and, and those types of misconduct, and I'm just saying that sort of in quotes, really a lot of times stems from a misunderstanding as to what is going on with an individual with one of these conditions and a stereotype. And the stereotype that somebody might present a danger because of a condition is just that. It's something that is sort of a, 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 a thought process without any particular knowledge behind that necessarily. And I want to make sure that you recognize as we go through this, a lot of the skills that we are able to bring into these kinds of programs as part of the accommodation process really will address and eliminate a lot of these kinds of concerns. Um, of course, those of you who are federal contractors have a different kind of obligation. Uh, it's, uh, remember, when you deal with having to put into an affirmative action program, it is not a quota. You, these are aspirational goals. Um, and talking with my colleagues that work with uh, those of you who are contractors as well as myself, you know, one of the things to realize is that these types of programs can be part of your outreach, can be part of your success toward reaching that utilization goal. Um, but certainly if you have a program that only really dips into one part of your workforce, you will not on that alone be responsive to the overall obligations because these obligations um, and the 7% utilization goal is across the board, not just with respect to certain pieces. Just a quick shout out, a couple great articles and links here for those of you who are interested to some um, terrific uh, presentations on the SAP program that I found were really enlightening and I wanted to just highlight that for you as well. And then uh, before our session started, uh, when we were making plans for this so a couple months ago, Michael and others kind of said, you know, what are the issues that the HR folks that are out there are really thinking about and noodling over and debating how to embrace these kinds of programs and integrate them? And the questions that were, you know, ranged from how do we deal with hiring processes and procedures, um, how do we deal with disclosure concerns because of the fact that you can't require uh, certain medical information to be shared, what are the, the sort of the additional uh, responsibilities that we might be taking on if we provide job coaches or mentors, and how do we handle discipline? So within these four topics, we decided to kind of highlight for you over the next couple of slides some of the um, thoughts that we have on how to address these potential considerations. And I think good news, and we've talked about this as a group, we really have not seen case law out there that is specifically identified and dismissed as unlawful one of these programs. Um, it's just, it, this is, again, I said we're sort of ahead of the curve. I think we need to be excited about the fact that these are the kinds of programs that seem to be bringing successes to employers and reducing some of the issues as opposed to presenting additional ones. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that over time, and it ebbs and flows obviously, there's a government interest and support for these kinds of programs. As Deb mentioned, you know, a lot of the work that they are doing is in part related to collaborative efforts with various agencies, and that's a, that is a, uh, a collaboration that I think gives credibility to these programs and potentially lessens the likelihood that they might be challenged from a legal perspective. I wanted to just highlight a couple things, and I um, certainly encourage Deb and Suzanne and David and others and Michael to chime in if you have any thoughts as we're going through. But one of the things to keep in mind with, with the ADA and hiring and, and sort of the concerns about targeted hiring processes is remember that the ADA non-discrimination and accommodation of, um, obligations apply top to bottom, right from the beginning. The moment somebody becomes an applicant, that person is entitled to the protections of the law. Um, the interesting thing is there was a law, unlike other EEO categories, where you could have a, a discrimination case based on race regardless of what your race is. But in the disability context, the law actually does not make it unlawful to discriminate against somebody because the person doesn't have a disability. So sort of that proactive, we are interested in advocating for and promoting individuals with disabilities conceptually doesn't violate the ADA at, the, at that level. So on the surface, it would not appear that the ADA prohibits some sort of distinct hiring process or, you know, for autism or other specifically defined neurological conditions. So I think that's a good thing for the perspective of how do we approach this. Now, one of the things we have to make sure, though, is that if we have programs that are sort of out there specifically highlighting and focusing and, and really increasing the outreach with respect to certain conditions and specific disabilities, 
we have to always make sure we're not discriminating against other individuals with disabilities. And that means that if you have somebody coming in with a different condition but needs the same kind of resources and support that we've been successful in providing in similar situations, that's going to be good evidence to us as an employer and would be meaningful to a court in analyzing the situation that this is something we might have to do for this other individual. Um, I want you to be careful, and, and this was brought up by Deb as well, we want to avoid creating, and David mentioned this too, that we are creating the impression that we're steering individuals to certain types of jobs because those are the, quote, easier ones for certain individuals to handle. I think that in and of itself is stereotypical. While we may identify certain types of skills for certain jobs where we have greater success with some of these job training programs, we have to make sure that regardless of the position for which a person applies, if they need accommodations, we have to assess it individually and figure out what can reasonably be provided. Um, I think a lot of um, the, the benefit and the positive of targeted programs is it might help with some of those Section 503 affirmative action outreach obligations. And I think something that a lot of us who think about these issues have said is that one of the things that's an easy thing to do and that really casts the outreach out a lot broader is to remember that we encourage people with disabilities to apply. Um, and we want to make sure that that is something that we emphasize. If this is something we believe in and we want to promote, that is something um, that I think could be of great value in uh, approaching some of these legal challenges. Um, one of the concerns I know some of you had is, well, how do you deal with disclosure? Because under the ADA, we're not allowed to ask about an applicant's medical condition prior to making a conditional job offer. Now, 503 provides for voluntary self-identification, so that's a little bit different. Um, and I think generally, over not as much now as perhaps before, but certainly it is still a compelling issue, there is a reluctance on individuals to reveal conditions because they're worried that somehow that will disqualify them from consideration because managers and hiring partners are not particularly um, aware of what some of the, um, the issues might be and are not necessarily going to be aware of how to handle some of that disclosure. I certainly think that targeted program encourages the increased application by individuals with disabilities. Having a program in your organization um, will in increase awareness by managers and supervisors and a, a better process, as Deb highlighted, in terms of the onboarding and the training process. But I think a lot of the, the ways around this to address potential concerns about the fact that the, one of these programs might invite disclosures inappropriately is you do the opposite. Instead of saying, tell me what you're all about, you use outreach, like using organizations out there in the field to say, we want you to tell us where the talent is and bring us qualified candidates. Focus on people's abilities to perform the position, not highlighting what they can't do and seeing if we can make it a good fit. Um, and certainly maintaining confidentiality within the organization and, and disclosing only on a need-to-know basis. And a lot of that has to do with the kind of programs Deb was mentioning where we go to the applicant or the employee and say, tell us what you would like us to share with others to help us make this a more successful um, endeavor. And then increasing training, I think, will also reduce the likelihood of individuals inappropriately disclosing information. In terms of accommodations, remember that you have to do it based upon that individualized assessment. And one of the concerns we've heard from folks is, well, if I have this program and all these great accommodations, is, does that mean I've got to duplicate this everywhere within my organization? And the duty to accommodate, as I said at the beginning, regardless of whether you have a targeted program or something um, more um, low-key, applies with respect to specific disabilities, but also individuals who are not within that particular program. And the issue of whether accommodations that are offered within one program um, must be offered to others, we recognize that that is of concern. But if you take a step back, and Deb, I'll ask you to kind of talk about this for a minute, if you don't mind you really have to realize your ob obligation has always been there. And it doesn't matter how formalized your program is, the kind of accommodations that you're successful in providing need to be provided for others as well, potentially. And Deb, have you had yes. some experience with that? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we, we have been obviously dealing with accommodation requests since well before the Autism at Work program was implemented for individuals with a million different types of diagnoses. Um, and so there's really nothing different in the program in terms of accommodations than there has been since, you know, since I've been at SAP. So our process generally is to, if an individual needs an accommodation, is to have them, 
you know, ask for it with, with supporting documentation. We do have a form that we've created to make it easier for individuals, and this is, again, pre-program form because a lot of doctor's offices don't have uh, forms that are ready to go that address all of the questions and issues that we have. And so we provide individuals with a form once they've indicated they need some type of accommodation, and then we work directly with them, sometimes with their medical provider. In the case of individuals in the program, if they have somebody that they want us to work with also, it could be a coach or a buddy or their mentor or a family member, we ask them just to sign a consent form indicating that they're okay with us and they want us discussing employment issues with this individual and we'll work with them as well to make sure that we understand what restrictions are in place and we can work together to come up with an appropriate accommodation. And I should note that when we say we ask them, you know, if, if they request an accommodation, it doesn't need to be somebody saying, hello, you know, I need an accommodation. Any indication that they might have a restriction on their ability to perform the essential functions of their job or any indication that they might need some type of accommodation qualifies, you know, as a request for an accommodation. Great. And I thanks, Deb. I think the last you know, topic of concern really had to do with progressive discipline and that sort of delicate balance between um, being able to uh, sort of implement and maintain your consistent conduct standards and discipline when there are violations of, of those standards. And, and the ADA creates that framework. It says, you know, you employer, you can maintain those performance standards. You can maintain those conduct standards. Um, with respect to performance, though, that always is with the major caveat in the accommodation context that you have to accommodate the manner in which somebody meets those performance standards as a potential reasonable accommodation. And that those sort of legal concepts tie in very nicely to the kinds of programs and initiatives that employers are using in this context. And then when you think about how do you, you know, balance that against, you know, potential claims somebody may make, well, I was inappropriately disciplined, um, I do think that it's important to recognize that consistency in dis implementing discipline is critical, regardless of whether it's this, the types of conditions we've been talking about today or other forms of disability. The times where I see employers have not um, have put themselves at risk and have not really set themselves up appropriately and consistently with, with the law is where they've said, well, we've had this violation. And then we look around and we say, you know, we've not enforced this at this level to this extent in any other context. Why would we do it in this particular situation? So those are, you know, sort of thinking through, am I being consistent? Are we making sure that we're avoiding some of those stereotypical assumptions on somebody's ability to improve or to address misconduct? And David, maybe you can chime in a little bit because I know you've had um, you know, a lot of work in this area where you've been helping look for sort of the, the, the skills and the assistance that employers can dip into to try to prepare for some of those challenges when there might be performance issues or conduct issues that have to be addressed. Do you have any suggestions you want to you put in at this point? You know, I don't have any um, specific examples to share, although, you know, I think what we've seen is um, really good work with partners, with partner community organizations. Um, there are a number on, on this webinar, actually, as we speak, and, and Autism Speaks can help connect you. But, you know, working with someone who knows the individual, has, has known their challenges and knows strategies that have been effective in the past, um, that can address, you know, uh, productivity issues or challenging behaviors that are likely not appearing for the first time. Um, so someone, someone with some experience and some direct knowledge of the individual, it, it really needs to be done on a case-by-case on -case basis uh, and based on, on that individual's needs. Yeah, and I'll, this is Deb. I'll, I'll echo what, what David said. I mean, we, we don't change our job descriptions or our expectations, uh, you know, for individuals that are participating in the program. These, these individuals are applying for jobs that are open to, to anybody. Um, who might be qualified. And so if we have an individual in the program who is not meeting those expectations, we need to address that just like we would address it for anyone else. Now, the methods we use might be slightly different because the individual might have a different way of communicating. Maybe they need um, something in writing before they have a meeting with their manager to discuss performance concerns or expectations. And so that's when we kind of loop in people from the program, whether, again, that be their mentor or buddy or coach or somebody that they've identified that they want working with them to fully understand that individual's needs and what the best way is to communicate our expectations and our concerns if we have any. Thanks, Deb. I think we're going to turn this back over to Michael now because I know we want to make sure we bring in um, <laughs> some time for questions. But I do, uh, I want to 
just echo a couple of things that Deb and David said about the importance of, of anticipating how some of those processes are going to go will really reduce the likelihood of you feeling like you're putting yourself in a position where you have to do something you're not otherwise prepared to do. So, Michael, turning it back over to you. Well, you can see, Linda, what a rich discussion this is. <laughs> um, <laughs> we can um, – all of these deserve a lot more time, but since we're coming to the end of the hour, let me try to very quickly um, – summarize, and then if we have time for questions, that would be great. Um, I want to emphasize a point you made, Linda, um, concerning the obligations. Um, the ADA obligations are on employers no matter what, whether they do a proactive program like this or not. And um, I think that's, you know, a key point that um, – how these programs can actually reduce the structure, a well-structured program can reduce. Um, I would note um, that among the employers we've met with, um, none has really seen an increase in ADA claims um, among uh, employees firm-wide, um, and also none has reported to us, you know, claims by participants in the programs. So that's part of it, and then the part of it is um, how a well-structured program, the points that you were just making, Linda, how a well-structured program can reduce the likelihood of claims um, as it leads companies to think through and document approaches, um, and how, in that sense, um, it can be, a, by being proactive, can be uh, a very positive. So let me review the, some of the uh, points, and then if we have um, a couple minutes for questions. Um, I think what we've covered that um, we've heard from David and Suzanne how firms are hearing from their own employees and are establishing programs. Um, we've also heard from them in terms of how the programs are generating legal questions um, that should be addressed. These are important questions, they're legitimate questions, hiring, disclosure, discipline, termination. Um, I think as you've set out, um, Linda, they're the issues that can be addressed and should be um, thought through. And um, then also that we have heard from employers, and David, I think this was something you mentioned to me earlier this week, that um, not only have they not only seen no increase in claims, uh, or no claims particularly regarded to these programs, but rather they speak of the value in improving the accommodations um, for all um, Employees, do you want to say something, David, on that? Sure. Yeah, this is this has absolutely been a shared experience among a number of companies we've worked with. Where while their initiative may be autism focused or autism led, um, what they have found is you know once they let that be known across their organization, uh, and, and Microsoft in particular has a great story about this. You know, kind of once they announce their intention and, and their openness to accommodating different needs. They have people who are currently employees come forward and disclose their own uh, disabilities and maybe needs that the employer was never made aware of in the past. And so companies that we're working with currently talk about how they really have learned to be better uh, at supporting each individual across the organization. It, it may have started with their autism hiring initiative, but now they're better serving their deaf employees and, and, and people with all sorts of other disabilities as well. And the other benefit I think they talk about in a lot of these companies is that be, they become better managers across the board, right, about how can we better manage our employees with their different levels of need, different styles, um, different communication styles. And I, I think e even us at Autism Speaks, for instance, are continuously learning how we can be better managers uh, of all of our employees. And it often stems from uh, a, a kind of focused initiative like this, but it can be broadened across the, the business. Good. Well, that is, again, come back to it, Linda, it's the point you made that employers have these obligations without um, doing any program. It's generally across the uh, employer field, um, but how these, by thinking through, being proactive, how these can uh, reduce. Um, Pat, we only have a couple minutes. Are there any questions that people have typed in? Otherwise, I have a few. I think the uh, they were answered on a one-to-one -one basis, so okay. I think uh, you could read your questions that you have now. Well, I think um, one question that was asked, and I'd ask the panelists, um, 
which is what requirements are there to be in existing programs? Um, do you need a written diagnosis? Do you need a self-diagnosis? How are these programs operating? So this is Deb for, for SAP, the program that, that we run right now, because we are working so closely with our partners, we don't actually ask for any kind of diagnosis or you know, self-disclosure. We work with the ARC and the ARC is the one who will provide us with candidates and say, you know, we have these candidates and, and we think that they would be a good fit for certain roles or maybe the candidate has said they think they're a good fit for the role and the ARC has worked with them to identify those particular roles. Um, and so our assumption is that they have a diagnosis, but that is certainly not a requirement for us to be provided with that type of medical information. Good. Um, Linda, let me ask, um, you mentioned in terms of the case law, um, the employer is still under ADA, um, if an ADA claim is made, still um, a, the, the ability of the employer to, to discipline is still recognized in these cases. Is it not, in other words, that yeah. employees are still held under the same standards um, of behaviors in general um, and um, held to the same discipline standards? Yeah, I, I would say yes, but I think what the courts are recognizing is that just as you would have to accommodate other types of challenges or limitations that somebody may have, when it comes to perhaps, let's make it an attendance issue that's perhaps um, a result of a, of a condition that somebody has, or whether it is a behavioral issue in terms of perhaps uh, inappropriate word choice or um, raising of a voice or not being as uh, capable in a certain situation of communicating appropriately, one of the things that the courts have recognized is that, yes, those things may be challenges, but at the same time, an employer has an obligation and a duty to accommodate the manner in which somebody meets those obligations. And so as, as Deb was suggesting, you know, sometimes you you do things sort of pro preventively or proactively to try to create situations where people will have greater success in a situation as opposed to waiting and seeing, well, what might happen. And by preventing and, and sort of anticipating some of those issues, like knowing that somebody with a certain condition is going to be, have more personal challenges in a group environment, but if we can create some space, whether it's actual or sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of, you know, uh, from an interaction standpoint, you know, a different quieter office space or ability and capacity to communicate with others in a slightly different way to reduce those issues, those are kinds of accommodations courts will expect employers to be considering. And sometimes the court will say, you know, you should have done a couple of these things in order to avoid the issue from happening. And that those cases are not as many, but what they are recognizing is the importance of anticipating. Uh, but I would agree with you. There are any number of court decisions that will that have continued to support employers who are implementing and enforcing consistent performance and conduct standards. So that piece hasn't changed. Good, good. Well, you know, Linda, I'm afraid we're run out of time now. It's uh, past 11. Let me just conclude on this note. Um, that um, today we see as a starting point. Again, we look forward to um, hearing from um, those involved in programs, thinking about programs, any legal issues. Um, you have our um, email addresses. I think Pat will also be sending out notes to everyone, but we really see this as an ongoing discussion and really I, I would say um, even in the years I've been in this uh, we're still in very initial stages. It's still a frontier. Um, and um, I think working together, um, we can really move this forward. So we look forward to working together, look forward to contacting. And finally, Pat, I think you'll be sending out a follow-up note with um, people should have the slides, but also um, links to this um, discussion today. That is correct. Good, good. Well, thank you all for attending. And again, uh, we look forward to working together. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now.